about that in a minute, but that's sort of the experience from which I will be telling this story. So just so you have a little bit of that background. Um, so as Dominique just explained, this is uh, a security talk, but it's gonna be really about application level and language level security. And we're going to talk about access control today. And um, so access control, I think you're all intuitively familiar with what that means. I just put a bunch of screenshots here of applications asking for permission to do something, right? Like an iOS app or a Mac app or an Android app or a web app asking access to your Dropbox account or your uh, OneDrive account. Or if you use Google Docs, you know, you can create these links where, you know, you know that people can have edit rights or read-only rights and so on and so forth, right? So this is, these are all examples of um, access control decisions, right? It's about certain resources that you have certain permissions, permissions to do something with. Now, I'm going to talk about JavaScript. And I guess for most of you, when I, I mentioned JavaScript, um, you will think about the web and about web programming and web applications. Um, and you might think, oh, it's going to talk about security in JavaScript. So it's going to be about uh, things like sort of OAuth, which is something you typically implement also client side uh, in the browser, or same origin policy, which is a kind of policy that uh, is uh, used by browsers to secure different web pages from one another, or HTML sanitization as well. So actually, a lot of these things are covered. If you're interested in those subjects, check out OWASP. It's a big a project where they try to document all of the security issues that come up in web applications. I'm actually not going to talk about that today at all. I'm going to look at uh, security in JavaScript from a software architecture point of view. And so you're not going to hear me talk about all these browser specific things. Instead, you're going to hear me talk about standard um, programming language concepts like modules and functions and data flow and so on and so forth. Um, and so uh, this is actually something, a sort of a, a view on security that is um, taken by a community that called themselves sort of capability security uh, people. And one of the, the people that I work with at Google then sort of one of the uh, people that's sort of at the helm of that movement is called Mark Miller. Um, and uh, one, of it, one of his quotes, which I think sums it up quite well, is like uh, his view on software security is that uh, application level security is really just the extreme, an extreme form of software modularity. And why is that? Well, if you think about it, um, I don't know if people here have followed, followed courses on software engineering and you're familiar with terms like coupling and cohesion between software modules in a large software system. But typically what they teach you there is if you design large scale software systems, you try to modularize things in such a way that you avoid needless dependencies among these modules, right? Like you don't want to create excess dependencies if they're not needed. And um, so modularity is all about avoiding needless dependencies in order to prevent bugs. And so if you think about it, security is also about sort of avoiding needless dependencies and needless vulnerabilities. And if that other module is compromised, you also can't be touched by it, right? So in other words, if you design software in a modular way, you will naturally reduce sort of the attack surface of your application. So that's sort of the, the philosophy behind this. Um, so object capabilities have um, uh, a prehistory uh, in the uh, operating systems world. And actually, uh, if you would go back and um, to the early 60s, sort of there was this seminal paper uh, written by um, Dennis and Van Horn, um, which talked about, for the first time, introduced the word capability, and it was used in the context of operating systems. So in order, it was de described as a mechanism with which to um, describe access control rights uh, between processes on a computer, right? So this is you know, er the early, early days. And then, um, first, 10 years later, uh, this originated from a company called TeamShare. They were sort of, a, today we would call them a startup. I don't think they called them startups in the 1970s, but it was a small company operating from Silicon Valley, creating uh, a time-sharing operating system, right? So back then, um, yeah, these, the time-sharing computer 
Uh, of course, back then in the 70s, you didn't have the dominance of the sort of Unix-based systems that we have today. And so they created, um, yeah, custom operating system was quite common in those days to have custom operating systems. And they, did the, they called the system Gnosis. It was later renamed to Kikos. But that was sort of the first operating system that applied these capability security uh, principles. And then, um, from 20 years later, again, uh, a sort of startup from Silicon Valley called Electric Communities created this programming language called E. And that was sort of the first, it's viewed as the first um, object capability programming language, which is basically you take like object oriented programming as sort of popularized by languages like Java. And you apply those principles, the same principles that were used in Kikos and so on to secure operating systems, you apply them um, at a higher level to secure applications. And then um, uh, in 2008, so uh, almost 20 years later, that same approach was then used by Google. And so this is sort of a project I collaborated on, it's called Caja, and Caja is Spanish for box. And it was all about uh, being able to take dynamic web content. So actually the screenshot here, it showed like a ticking clock, but it's not ticking, it's just a static screenshot. But it was like a widget containing a, a, a clock that was rendered using JavaScript. And you could then sort of take that script and sort of copy paste it into a website, knowing that even if that code was, was compromised or tried to stage attacks, like try to steal, uh, the user's browser history or cookies and so on, that they couldn't do that, right? So it's all about sandboxing JavaScript code. That's what they, they use this for. And then today, actually, um, so say that same approach, uh, that capability approach is used by a company called Agoric, uh, and they're using this uh, capability-based security approach to develop um, a DeFi platform. I don't know if people here have heard of DeFi, decentralized finance, it's kind of like a new breed of financial services enabling peer-to-peer -peer, uh, commerce online uh, supported using blockchains and digital assets or tokens. And so in their system, you know, they develop what these programs called smart contracts, which are programs that can automatically move digital tokens around. And so security is absolutely paramount in that context and use this sort of secure subset of JavaScript to do that. So just examples, all well, examples of where these the techniques I'm gonna talk about next are all used in practice. So, so the rest of this lecture is sort of divided into four parts. Um, first, I'm going to talk about why application security is so critical to JavaScript applications today. And then second, I'm going to talk about uh, this sort of overarching principle of capability-based systems, which is called principle of least authority or POLA. And I'm going to do that really by example using a very, very concrete example, gonna walk you through possible attack scenarios and how to defend against them. And then in the third part, I'm gonna zoom out a bit, take a step back and just talk a little bit about this object capability model uh, in general. And then in the fourth and last part, we're gonna talk about design patterns uh, to uh, securely combine objects coming from different modules to, to cooperate in a secure way. So let's start with um, why application security today is so critical, uh, for not just to JavaScript applications, but uh, most certainly also to JavaScript applications. So maybe just a quick poll in, to, to sort of get to know the audience here. So who here has written code in JavaScript before? Okay, so the majority of people. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, it, I think according to you know, GitHub uh, runs these yearly developer surveys uh, where they sort of poll for the popularity of languages. I think JavaScript for the last few years has always been sort of the, the dominant language. I mean, the language that uh, uh, most developers use or have used. Um, and there's a reason for that. And that is that JavaScript, even though it all started with web development, JavaScript was the the first language to be used in a browser, right? Uh, so it was Netscape. Uh, so that was like the first browser company uh, back in the 90s that introduced JavaScript as a way of programming websites. Uh, but today, JavaScript is really widely used across different tiers. So it's, it's actually used in uh, uh, for embedded systems programming. So there exists uh, 
like little microcontrollers that can run JavaScript. Of course, there's like, it's not the same JavaScript engines that run in the browser. So there's like, for instance, XS is a, is a very, very uh, tiny uh, JavaScript runtime. So you can actually uh, run your JavaScript code on a small device. There's uh, mobile, of course. So you might have heard of a framework called React Native from Facebook. Uh, so you can write your code, your mobile app in JavaScript, and then have it automatically get converted into an iOS app or an Android app. Um, of course, yeah, it runs in the browser. That's what we all know. It also runs on the desktop. So there's these um, frameworks like WinJS, for, for instance, Windows, uh, to write Windows apps in JavaScript. Uh, on the server, most so probably a lot of you have heard of Node.js, which is a server-side JavaScript environment. Uh, and it's also used as to embed scripts that uh, run in the database, like MongoDB. You can actually run uh, JavaScript scripts on your stored data. So really, across all tiers, it's uh, being used today. And that means that from a security point of view, you're not just talking anymore about uh, you know, securing JavaScript does not, does not just mean making sure that a website can't uh, get hold of your cookies or uh, your browser history, but also you know, if you're talking about the security of a backend application written in Node.js, it's really about uh, what file system can this uh, process access, what uh, network access does it have, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the, the possibilities for attacks are larger. Now, another interesting fact about JavaScript, and this is probably true for most popular languages today, is just um, the fact that they are built from thousands of existing modules. Uh, so, um, so who here has heard of or used NPM? Again, yeah, probably everyone that has <laughs> raised their hands when they said I use JavaScript has probably used NPM. It's the package manager, Node package manager, um, that is used to package JavaScript libraries. And this is a graph, I just pulled a recent version this morning, showing uh, from 2010 till today, sort of the evolution of uh, how many packages are available on um, the, the, the biggest software package managers for different languages. And so the red line is, uh, I think your battery is dying. <laughs> the battery of the clicker is dying. Uh, so this um, red line is actually uh, the number of modules available on NPM. And then the rest is like uh, Maven uh, for Java, uh, by, by, uh, for Python and so on. And you can see sort of the stark contrast here. Um, so earlier this year, they actually crossed the line of 2 million modules uh, being available on NPM. Now, a lot of those modules are uh, you know, of questionable quality, you could say, but even if, even if just one in 10 is, uh, is, a, is an interesting library, you know, the amount of modules you can use today uh, in NPM is really quite massive. And it's not just that. Um, so um, it's not just that there's a lot of modules, it's also that um, you know, the average modern web application has over a thousand modules. That was from a blog from, uh, uh, from the NPM blog. So average JavaScript app, a thousand modules, and 97% of the code base is code that is actually downloaded from NPM. And the remaining 3% is sort of what the developer adds. Um, so that means that it is today really exceedingly common to run, okay, there's a question. No, uh, I, I, I think it, it is explained on the module counts website what the error is, but I think it has to do with uh, they, they changed their script on that day to, to compute the count different. So yeah, it's not that there was like a, a huge jump. Uh, so it, it's explained there, but it's it's not important for uh, the point I'm making. Okay, no, no worries. Okay, so so that what this means is it's. Um, it's really common today to run code in your as part of your application that you don't know or should trust, right? Like you're doing npm install of some package, uh, like you haven't written that code, you've probably not reviewed that code in detail. Um, so what can go wrong um, um, in in these scenarios? So so for instance, something wrong with the. Uh, Sorry. So, uh, so for instance, 
In a browser, you might have a web page, and the web page is comprised of different modules that uh, are able to access the, the document object model, uh, which is the, you know, the HTML page itself, so they can write to it, so to modify what the user sees. Um, and uh, you have your cookies and all sorts of other things that these modules can just access if you include them in your web page. Um, similarly, on Node.js, of course, you can have a web server application running on a server comprised of multiple modules, and those modules can all make web requests, HTTP requests. They can all access the file system, right? Because Node provides those uh, built-in libraries. And then if you think about the Agoric use case there, we have uh, you know, modules running as part of a smart contract that can access your digital tokens, your cryptocurrencies, and so on. And again, if you're including there some raw code, you can imagine the, what the consequences are. And so, so let me give you some examples of what can happen when code goes rogue. Um, so this is an example that's already a bit dated from 2009. Uh, but I like it because it was actually an exploit on, in the New York Times, which is a decent newspaper, and they certainly do invest a lot in uh, security of their, their web page. But basically, they tweeted like uh, that they essentially had an, uh, an ad, an advertisement that was included on the web page that was actually a, a sort of a virus, or like if you clicked on it, it sort of sent you to malware, right? Uh, so this is an example of essentially a web page including some script from a domain that they actually, well, I say evil.com here, but it was actually a domain they trusted, right? Uh, that there was a hijack of the external advertiser causing the exploit. Um, on Node, the, probably the one of the, the biggest events there that happened uh, that was in, let me see, 2018. It's called the event stream incident. Uh, if you Google that, you'll find a lot of information about that. But essentially what that was is, Event stream was a very popular library. It was like downloaded millions of times. It was used as a dependency on a lot of other popular packages. And uh, the maintainer essentially, um, I think either they left or they they allowed access, like commit access to a third party that actually planted using obfuscated code, a piece of software that when you would install this library would run a script that would search on your developer website on your developer machine for uh, whether you had a cryptocurrency wallet installed locally. And if yes, it extracted ex the uh, private keys from your wallet and posted them uh, to a website of the attacker, right? So they could actually steal your cryptocurrency. Um, so these are all examples of what are known as software supply chain attacks. Who here has heard of software supply chain attacks? That ring a bell? Some people, okay. Yeah, so software supply chain attacks are an increasingly a problem. Uh, and uh, I actually just took this from a, a blog post from earlier this year from a, a company that specializes in application security, right? So trusting code within supply chain has become really problematic. Um, and so increasingly people are uh, aware that this is a problem. Maybe you've heard of the solar winds attack. If you haven't, you should Google that. It's a, that's a, a great example of a high profile uh, software supply chain attack. Now the good news is that ever since EventStream, ever since SolarWinds, um, people are much more aware of uh, software supply chain attacks. And uh, as a result, the community has responded with some great tools. Uh, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you that have worked with uh, JavaScript packages, and if you're you know, using GitHub, you, you might have seen these sort of security alerts. If you use uh, NPM, so, uh, GitHub will send you security alerts. If your project is using dependencies that have known vulnerabilities, NPM has this sort of audit functionality, and they will warn you also if you're trying to install packages that have known security vulnerabilities. There's this company called Snyke. They have this vulnerability database that logs uh, vulnerabilities related to JavaScript packages and so on. Um, so, so this is great, but these tools really sort of address the symptoms. They don't really address the root cause, which is how do you decide what code to trust or not? So also from this blog, right, uh, the guy here says, as long as we keep ignoring the core of the problem, which is how do you trust code, we are not handling software supply chain. And so this is great, it gives you awareness like, oh, I need to patch my code and I, I'm depending on some vulnerable uh, package. 
but it's not addressing the root cause. And the root cause is actually that when you include code from a third party, that that code is running with the full authority of the user or the full authority of your entire application. And so um, whether it is in the browser or in Node or on the blockchain, um, typically you just have one web page and the web page doesn't know uh, what are the trust boundaries between those modules or the web server doesn't know what the trust boundaries are. You just npm install something, you include it in your JavaScript app and you know, whether it's this module, your module that's making HTTP requests or the attacker's module that's making HTTP requests to Node.js, it's all the same, right? And so what we want to do with capabilities is to change this and to actually apply what's called, uh, I mentioned it before, the principle of least authority to your application design, so POLA. And so um, principle of least authority is all about um, giving modules only access to those resources they need to do their job and nothing more. I think that, that's basically what it, what it boils down to. Um, and let me now uh, explain to you that principle using just a very simple example, some very concrete example. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a very simple scenario where we have a uh, JavaScript application with two modules that we're importing called um, Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob will, will get a pointer to a shared object that we call the log. And here's the code for that. Uh, so we have, uh, we're just importing Alice and Bob. Uh, we have a log object, I'll get to that in a minute. So we're instantiating the log object and we're giving a pointer uh, to the log to Alice and a pointer to log to Bob. And the, let's say the security uh, claim that we want to make or the access control that we want to impose on this problem is that, um, on this program, sorry, is that we would like Alice to only be able to write to the log and Bob uh, to be only able to uh, read from the log. And so um, over here you can see that the log is just uh, a really simple object that has two methods, write and read, so we are able to write some message to the log, we're able to read all the messages and here in this very simple example, I'm just uh, creating an array to store the messages, an array of strings. Uh, writing just pushes the message onto that array and reading just returns a pointer in the array. Okay, just very simple, but I hope you get the gist here of uh, the access control policy we want to sort of enforce. This is the JavaScript. Right, yes, yes, absolutely. It's using classes and so on, but that's the new Yes, <laughs> indeed. So, uh, yeah, uh, those of us old enough to remember, <laughs> no, uh, and, uh, so JavaScript for a long time didn't have the class syntax, so you had to sort of uh, create objects in a different style. I'm guessing most people today, if you learn Java, if you've learned JavaScript in the last say five six years, um, then uh, typically, yeah, you can <laughs> you can use class syntax. Uh, it's very similar to the Java syntax extension, right? Um, okay, so so what, we're, what we now want to, to do is, is to think about, okay, if Bob goes rogue, um, what would go wrong, right? Uh, meaning we said Bob can only read from the log, can he actually circumvent that policy? Okay, in fact, there's many, many ways in which Bob can break this program. Uh, if you're not careful. And um, I'm going to go over the code on the right uh, uh, in a piecemeal fashion. Uh, so don't look at it yet. Uh, we'll go through it. Actually, I'm, I'm going to start with this, uh, this lower um, bottom part here. Uh, and this is a little bit tricky uh, because now we're getting into sort of the details of JavaScript. But um, essentially, uh, so in JavaScript, you have, for instance, arrays. There are built-in objects, right? I can, I can just create like an empty array, and then I can I have this push method that's just like a built-in function from that JavaScript provides you. Uh, the, the thing is, in JavaScript, all of these built-in objects, they're mutable. That means that even though typically people don't, normal developers don't do that, it is actually possible to um, take the array object take its prototype where all of these built-in functions are stored, take the push method that you use to normally push things onto an array, 
and just replace it with uh, your own function, right? In this case, a function that says I'm not logging anything because uh, so if Alice would call that function, um, her messages will just get dropped. They will not get added to the error. Um, and this is called um, in the jargon prototype poisoning. That's a, a term that JavaScript developers use to describe the security vulnerability prototype poisoning. Um, so um, how do you how do you fix that? Um, so the way you fix that is uh, you have to be able to sandbox a JavaScript module into its own environment where it has its access to its own array object, uh, or, or better yet, you have a way that you make all of those built-in objects immutable. Because as I said, um, neither as a best practice and nor people tend to not to do that, right? So this is one of these things where Attackers will exploit this, but regular developers will never use this. So it's better to just turn off that feature. Um, now, JavaScript doesn't have a standardized way of um, isolating modules. There's a few non-standard ways. So in the browser, you have these things called web workers or iframes, which uh, if you include an iframe in your web page, the code running in that iframe will actually have its own separate JavaScript environment. Uh, but it creates problems uh, a problem called identity discontinuity, which is that if you create an array in that subframe and you pass it back to the main page, the main page will not recognize it as one of its arrays. So you get all these kind of weird issues. Uh, in no Node.js, there's a, a built-in module called VM, which you can use to run code in a new environment. Uh, but again, it's sort of a, a non-standard. It only works in Node. So JavaScript standards committee so these are one of the things that typically are discussed in the standards committee is like, should we extend the JavaScript language with a uh, standardized way of creating sandboxes, right? And that discussion is actually still ongoing in the committee. Uh, so they have this, um, you know, whenever you try to modify a language, it's actually very similar to how network protocols get updated or blockchains, like you have these RFCs, if you will, you have these standardized processes where you have to first describe the problem and then it gets reviewed as well as forth. In JavaScript, they call this um, these stages. And so there's one proposal now that's in the, on the standards track called Shadow Realms. And the idea of a Shadow Realm is that you can actually create, um, so you, you can create these separate, within a single JavaScript process, you can create these uh, Shadow Realms for a little bit like iframes, except this would work in Node.js, it would work in the browser, it would work in any environment that includes a standard JavaScript engine. Uh, and the basic idea is that each one of these realms has its own version of the uh, of the built-in objects, like array, math, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's another uh, standard track proposal called compartments, which uh, allows you to take a, a realm and divide it up even further into what are called compartments, uh, and uh, when you use that, the, uh, all the compartments can share access to the same built-in objects like array and math, but they are uh, they become immutable, so you can't change them anymore. And so uh, now this is still on a standard track, but you can already download libraries that implement this proposal today and use it today. Um, both, yes, both, uh, and one of them which I'll actually use and demonstrate in a minute, um, is called uh, uh, Sahar in JavaScript. Uh, another name for it is secure ECMAScript, it's the same thing. It's essentially a secure subset of JavaScript that uses these compartments to isolate module. And so, um, so if, you have, if you picture a Venn diagram, like you have the full JavaScript language, uh, and then there's this thing called script, strict mode JavaScript, uh, that's been around for since like more than 10 years. Um, and if you use JavaScript modern modules, uh, you'll all, always be programming in strict mode. Um, so it, it, it removes some, some parts from the language that make it particularly uh, difficult to do good security uh, practices. And then hardened JavaScript essentially says, okay, we're gonna take, let's say standard JavaScript, but uh, we have these compartments and also all the global objects that the environment gives you, the host environment, uh, we're going to remove those. And so for instance, in Node.js, you have a function called require, and with require, you can import 
like the file system module, you can import networking modules and so on and so forth. Um, so when you're in hard JavaScript uh, and you load code, that code can't do that anymore. So by default, the code can't do, can do nothing but create objects and numbers and strings and do such and like that. The basic things you can do in a language, but it doesn't have any access to, um, to uh, objects that can potentially uh, do kind of like a privilege escalation where you leak data by posting it to a server or you scan the file system and these kinds of things. Okay, so now uh, how do you practically use that today? Well, there's a tool called Lava Mode. It was developed by a company called um, MetaMask. Uh, so MetaMask is a, a company that creates a cryptocurrency wallet, a browser wallet. Um, so for them, clearly they're in the cryptocurrency business. So security is uh, paramount uh, to them. And so, so they created this tool called Lava Mode. What does it do? Well, it's essentially a tool that allows you to take all of your package dependencies when you have a JavaScript project and put each package dependency into its own hardened JavaScript sandbox. It also auto-generates this configuration file that uh, for each package will tell you what the potentially dangerous objects are that that package is using, right? Um, so, uh, for instance, here it says, well, the stream HTTP library that you depend on actually accesses the XML HTTP request and fetch uh, functions, which allow you to do uh, HTTP requests. And uh, by default, it, it sets all those flags to true, them and set them to false to explicitly deny access to that resource uh, from that package, right? So it's a little bit similar to the screenshot side showed in the beginning. If iOS asks you, this application wants to use your camera, you say yes or no, right? This is sort of similar, right? But then for really lower level um, capabilities that these applications want to use. So are you going to explain how this is a force? Um, I'm not going to explain how it is enforced, but essentially what a Lava mode does is, um, well, I, I'm, I'm going to explain the principle, uh, but the basic, the basic idea is actually that when Lava Mode instantiates your code in the sandbox, it'll replace the built-in functions with proxy functionality that reads that config file and will say, okay, am I allowed to expose this property from this object or should I hide it? And that is how, how they actually enforce it. And so this is actually, a, a, it's a pretty practical tool. Uh, you can find it on GitHub and it plugs into tools like Webpack and Browserify. Again, if you've done some web development, you'll know what these tools are. Essentially, they allow you to sort of package up your entire JavaScript application. And it's just uh, plugs into that. Now, um, the cool thing about Lava Mode is that it really enables more focused security reviews because, um, so they also, next to this sort of tool to generate a config file, uh, they also have a visualizer that visualizes your package dependencies and um, colors them, uh, like green or red, essentially, according to whether that package has access to potentially dangerous capabilities like file system access or, or um, uh, remote uh, HTTP calls. And um, th th their insight, and actually a really good one, is that there's a lot of JavaScript that libraries out there that uh, will just, you know, for instance, uh, a library to format dates, right? Like you, you have a, a string and you want to format it according to a certain locale. That library just manipulates strings. It, it, it never accesses the file system. It doesn't do HTTP gets or posts. As a result, um, uh, LavaMode is able to infer like, okay, this, this library only uses built-in built -in things in, in JavaScript. As a result, it can't really do anything potentially dangerous and it colors that library green. And so what this tool allows you to do is to much more quickly assess when you depend on a module and that module depends on another module and so on and so forth. You have this whole dependency graph. Um, so here, the, the purple one is the is your package. Sorry, the clicker is not cooperating. Uh, right, so there's this, and everything else is just package dependencies. Uh, transitive, direct and transitive package dependencies. And so you can immediately see how um, 
And all of that is green, meaning if you do security review, you can just not look at those packages because you know that they're they're not using anything dangerous. And of course, Lava Mode will enforce that it's not using anything dangerous. But uh, when it's going to load that code, because it didn't see your code that you were trying to access any any special special objects, it's also going to just remove those objects from the global scope. And when your code runs, if it would try to do fishy things with eval uh, or you know all these kind of, like you know in JavaScript you can create a string dynamically and then just evaluate it, um, it's still going to fail those attacks because Lava Mode will just run your code in a sandbox. Okay, so if we go back to our example. Um, if we run Alice and Bob's code in a compartment, then this poisoning attack fails, and Bob will actually get an exception when he tries to uh, do a, a find for this function. Okay, and I'll I'll actually demonstrate that in a minute. So um, one down, three to go. So remember, I said we want Alice to only write to the log and Bob to only read from the log. So uh, there's a more direct attack that Bob can stage, which is just you can take the log object and just um, override the write function uh, with his own function. So rather than overriding the built-in push function, he can just uh, attack the object directly. Um, now in JavaScript, there is a, a way to protect against that. So there's this uh, function called object.freeze. And if you call this on a... Uh, on, on an object, it will make all of the properties of the object immutable so that attack fails. Now, um, the problem is uh, in JavaScript, uh, if you take log.write, which is a function object, it itself has mutable properties that you can then still override. And so um, what hardened JavaScript does is it says, well, don't use the built-in object freeze because that only freezes the object you, you pass it directly. Use a function called harden, and harden will actually um, do a freeze of the object and recursively traverse all the properties and uh, harden those as well. So, and essentially, if you give it an object, it'll just walk the entire tree of objects reachable from that object and make sure they're all frozen. If you do that, this attack um, fails because Bob, when he tries to override that function, will get an exception. Um, there's another way that Bob can. Uh, um, attack this code, which is he can, uh, because I'm returning a pointer when I um, invoke the read function, uh, I'm returning a pointer to this uh, array. And uh, so what Bob can do is he can call read to get a uh, pointer to that array and then set the length of that array to zero, which is a way of sort of um, uh, flushing all the messages from the log. So again, he's sort of being able, he's able to manipulate that. Um, the way this is typically dealt with in, if you're doing defensive programming is you want to make sure that you never return uh, pointers to mutable data in your own module. And so uh, typically you want to return a copy of the data. And here I'm just very, very naively uh, using a little JavaScript trick to uh, take the messages uh, and return them in a fresh array. So I'm just making a copy of the array. Now, in reality, don't do this unless the, the areas are very small. There's actually libraries out there like uh, immutable.js, um, which uh, offer you the immutable JS, I think is a, developed by Facebook. Uh, it's a library that gives you data structures that are mutable but functional. So let's say if you have a tree and you want to add a, a leaf to the tree, it will give you a pointer to a new tree. Uh, but it's implemented very efficiently in such a way that if you add millions of items to the tree, that you're not just always copying the entire tree, but you're sort of efficiently sharing data between those trees. So um, that's just a, a side note here. The final attack that Bob can stage is that he can just call the write method because we actually passed him a pointer to the log object and the log object has a read and a write method. Um, so that's sort of a basic obvious attack here. And um, the way we can solve that is to, for instance, say, well, we're only going to give Alice a pointer to the write function, and we're only going to give Bob a pointer to the read function. Uh, now, if you want to do that in JavaScript, you actually have to, um, the way this code is written, you actually have to call this uh, function called bind to make sure that within this code, the, the uh, value of the this pointer stays bound to that, that log. 
but that again is sort of like a JavaScript detail. It's not too important. The important thing here is if you want to make this code safe according to that access control policy, you need to uh, make sure that Alice only has a pointer to the right function, Bob only has a pointer to the read function. And with that, we have thwarted all of evil Bob's uh, attacks. Um, now, there's a question here. So you, you heard me talk about, yeah, you need to use the harden function. Uh, you need to take care uh, that you copy mutable data. You need to make sure that you call this bind function and so on and so forth. Um, that's a lot of burden to put on the client of your log class, right? So are there patterns, design patterns that you can use to um, make it easier for the client to work with these um, what we call defensive objects. So objects that are able to defend against all of these kinds of attacks. Um, and so there is this pattern, it's called the function as object pattern. Uh, people like Doug Crockford have advocated it, Martin Fowler. So Doug Crockford is the inventor of JSON. Martin Fowler is a, a very widely respected software architect. So they have come up with this pattern that they call function as object, which is essentially um, uh, rather than using the class syntax in JavaScript, you use uh, just a standard function to uh, create new instances of an object. So this is the, the make log function here. Every time you call it, like here, uh, it will just return a new object. And uh, we are hardening that object. So we're moving the harden from outside of the constructor to inside the constructor. That's one thing. The other thing we do is, um, we just create nested functions to represent the methods of the object. And those nested functions, we just return them. Uh, if you don't know this syntax here, so this is the same as writing read colon uh, read, write colon write. So it just uh, takes those functions and it includes them as properties of this little object here. And then the, uh, the messages array just becomes a, like a privately scoped variable inside of that function. And now you can, you notice that we're not using the this keyword anymore. So there's no this keywords anymore. So we don't need to use this bind thing. It all becomes a lot simpler, right? So it's it's simpler and it, as I will show, it's actually more secure. Uh, but a lot of JavaScript developers are not really familiar with that style, even though it's a great pattern to uh, write more robust code. Um, so this is, let's um, continue with that style, right? Uh, functions object. So now, what if Alice and Bob need more authority over time, right? So authority means like you have the authority to write or to read. Now let's say there's also a, a third method called size, which you can use to uh, get the number of messages in the log. Uh, what we need to do is we need to update the code to include that, that new, new method. But now also, you know, Alice and Bob who use the log object, it's kind of annoying. I need to sort of change their signature so that they can, like Alice can both write and get the size and Bob can both read and get the size. That's kind of annoying. So uh, another a pattern that is typically used in this kind of object capability style of programming is that you um, you can create sub objects. Like here I'm creating an outer object and it has a reader property and a writer property and the reader uh, contains the read and the size. It's another object with the read and size methods and the writer, another object with the write and size methods. And so it's nested objects, actually. Uh, and then I can just pass to Alice a pointer to the writer facet of this object and Bob a pointer to the reader facet of the object. And so typically you use a facet to say, to you think about your API in terms of who is allowed to do what, right? Like in a document system, you have like read-only access and, and writable access, uh, but it sort of depends on the application. And you say, okay, this type of client can only do these kinds of permissions. This type of client can only use that kind of permissions. And you group them. You can actually group them uh, in different sub-objects, okay? So that is how this is typically used. Um, so let me give you a quick uh, demo. Yeah, it's called it's called function as object, uh, and uh, well, I actually got that name from a, uh, a blog from Martin Fowler. So if you go, to, if you but if you just Google function as object Fowler Martin Fowler, you will uh, find it. I don't think Crockford. So he 
Artforce has written a couple of widely known books about JavaScript, like JavaScript the Good Parts. Um, I'm not sure if he actually uses that name, but he definitely uh, uses that pattern. Uh, but I think, yeah, um, Fowler uh, came up with that term, function as objects. Okay. Yeah, and the name comes from the fact that you're using just plain JavaScript functions to represent the constructor. And so instead of having this special constructor, you just use a, a standard function. And instead of having these methods, you just use nested functions. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna uh, just walk you through this example in lava mode. Uh, the code here that I'm sharing is also on GitHub. So you can have a look at that if you want. Um, okay, so let me um, open my yes. code. I hope you can read that. Uh, should I increase the font size a bit more or is it, is it readable in the back? Yeah, okay, great. So, so this is um, the code I showed you earlier with the, uh, the log class. Uh, we have uh, Alice and Bob, which I sort of include from an external module. Um, and uh, so let's have a look. Uh, so what does Alice do? Alice is just going to get a, get a pointer to this log object, and she's going to write the uh, message Alice into the log. And then Bob, um, so uh, actually I, I put here a little switch depending on how I invoke the program with like key one, two, three, four, I'm gonna stage those attacks. Uh -huh. But so let's skip over that for now. Uh, if you just run Bob without staging an attack, he's just gonna read from the log and that's it. Okay, so don't worry too much about this, just a way of staging these attacks. Um, so let's run this and see what it does. Okay, so I'm running the code. Alice is writing uh, her name to the log. Bob is reading the content of the log. And then at the very end of this program, I'm uh, calling read again. And you see that it just contains the name Alice. Now let's, um, let's stage the first attack. So the first attack was that, um, sorry, is that a little bit? So uh, Bob is replacing the array built-in function. So it's just gonna take the build an array object and override uh, push with his own evil push function. So let's see what that does. Uh, so we run it and now you can see that the logs are empty. Why are the logs empty? Because the, the push function doesn't actually push anything onto the array anymore. Um, second attack. So here Bob is replacing directly the write method. So again, if I run the second attack, you see that the uh, arrays are empty because um, the write function doesn't do anything. Sorry? Yeah, so the, that's a very good, you've been very attentive, Dominique. <laughs> so uh, what I'm actually doing is I'm um, first initializing the modules and then letting them run. So because indeed Bob needs to have the opportunity to insert his, so let's assume Bob gets loaded and as part of his loading, he sort of, uh, he updates the write method. And that's why when Alice actually runs, uh, Bob has already been able to infect the, uh, the object. Yeah, but very, very good, <laughs> very good catch. Uh, so um, for the third attack, let, let's have a look at the third attack. What was the third attack? Oh yeah, that, the third attack was that Bob would be able to delete the entire log by calling read, getting a uh, pointer to that array and then setting the length of that array to zero. zero. And what you can see is, yeah, uh, so Bob is indeed able to read the log, but then at the end, he's sort of, um, oh, uh, you know, flushing the array. And then the fourth attack, if I run the fourth attack, um, then that's just Bob uh, right, calling the write function on the log. And you see that uh, Bob's message gets, uh, so he's pointing the log message. Yeah, question? Ah, okay. Uh, I think that's just gonna introduce uh, undefined values. So let's just do it and I can try and see what it gives. 
yeah, as you can see, so it's it's actually expanding the array and adding a bunch of empty, well, the node says empty items, it's actually uh, four undefined uh, values. Yeah, but, so yeah, same, same effect, right? He's, he's able to modify the array. Um, okay, so now let's um, have a look at our uh, setup two here. So setup two really is the same code, but now I'm uh, using this uh, um, function as object pattern. Uh, so you see here, I'm using this reader and writer uh, facet. I'm calling uh, the harden function. And because I'm assuming this code will run in a, in a lava mode sandbox. Uh, and um, I'm passing the writer to Alice. I'm passing the reader to Bob. I'm calling Alice and Bob, and then I'm going to read again. So same thing. And Alice and Bob are unchanged. So same, same as before. So now I'm going to run. So you saw that I, I just used the uh, earlier, I just used Node.js, but now I'm going to um, invoke a little script that um, runs lava mode. And so lava mode, you can just do npm install lava mode, pull down the tool, it has an executable that is like a stand-in for, for Node.js, but it will instead run all of your code in these sandboxes. So if I do that, um, then, um, yeah, it's preparing the JavaScript, and then uh, you can see it prints out a bunch of stuff that it actually removed. Uh, don't worry about that. Uh, but uh, the output is identical to the uh, previous output. So in this ex example, Bob didn't stage any attacks. Right? So Alice wrote uh, her name to the log, and we are able to read that. So everything's fine. But now let's have a look at what happens when I um, when I uh, stage these attacks. So again, go back to attack number one, that is trying to replace the built-in array function. So let's see what that does. Uh, so if I run that, uh, the code crashes with an, an error saying, I can't assign to a read-only property push off root array present by push, meaning essentially this proves that we're running this code in a sandbox where all of these built-in functions are uh, uh, immutable. Uh, the second attack was that Bob could just replace that write function directly on the log object, right? Uh, so we've used the harden function that is built into this uh, lava mode environment. So let's see what that does. Uh, so if I run that attack, it says type error can, cannot add a property write because the object is not extensible. So this is because we've sort of locked down that object with the harden function. Okay, so attack fails. Third attack that was about um, you know trying to modify this length property. So let's run that. Uh, you see that it uh, both fails, so the, the array is not flushed because in my code I've uh, taken this strategy of sort of returning a copy. Right? So that's why this attack also fails. And then finally, um, the fourth attack was that okay, Bob can just write to the log. Uh, of course, now he can't. Uh, so log.write is not a function, you get an error, why? Because um, I've only given Bob access to the reader uh, object and the reader object only has a read and a size. Okay, so very simple example, but I hope that sort of gives you a flavor of what we mean by principle of least author. Okay, it's rewriting and repartitioning the, the permissions in your code such that um, you really try to make sure that uh, when you pass a pointer to, to your objects to some third party module that you don't trust, that that module can't just start interfering with your API, right? Like you just give it access to the things you think it can do. Because, yeah, most JavaScript developers, they don't think about all of these different types of attacks that you can stage, but this is actually how you can sort of start introducing, uh, circumventing uh, the access control. Okay. So let me switch back uh, to the demo. Okay, so, um, so this was the first part. And so um, let's do a quick recap. What have we learned? So modern JavaScript applications are composed from a lot of different modules. Like remember this, the slide with the sort of 2 million NPM modules, right? There's no way that you can trust all of those modules. Even if you inspect your direct dependencies, those recursive dependencies and so on. Traditional security boundaries don't exist between modules of an application, okay? So the browser helps you like saying, okay, 
every application that runs in a separate tab, I will run in a separate domain, I will run in a separate process. But once modules are part of the same application, you know, the OS won't help you, the browser won't help you. Um, so, but isolated modules, those isolated modules, uh, if you've isolated them, typically you do want those modules to cooperate, right? That you want to create your application. And so you need fine grained access control to compose functionality from different modules in a least operating manner. And we'll, we'll get to that uh, soon. These are these object capability patterns. So I promised earlier that I would take a step back now and talk about object capabilities, not you know, looking at all of these very idiosyncratic JavaScript details. Um, and so let me do that now in the coming uh, few slides. So um, capabilities or object capabilities are a type of access control mechanism, right? Uh, what is access control, right? It has to do with you have a bunch of resources like files or documents or, uh, you know, domain names, whatever things you want to protect. And then you have some authority like, for instance, in the file system, you can talk about read-only access or read-write access and so on. And typically, you know, in, in operating system and uh, programming languages literature, we talk about an access control matrix, right? Where you have uh, principles as a row, like Alice, Bob, Carol, they're the names of people or the names of processes in your OS. And then you have the columns are the resources, like, uh, certain files in your uh, your file system, for example, right? And then in the, uh, in the grids, you can describe the permissions, okay? Um, so, so how is, how are object capabilities different from the way operating systems traditionally look at access control of resources? Uh, so to, to explain to, that to you, let's look at the um, two different types of, uh, programs that copy files. And so on the left-hand side, you see that I'm using uh, the copy utility from uh, in, in Linux, right? So, uh, so I'm copying the program and I'm passing to program the names of two files, uh, home tom in.txt, a text file, and home part out.txt, right? And so the idea is, you know, copy this file to there, okay? Um, and you know, in operating systems, I guess most of you have done some kind of Linux programming, you know that files have permissions, you have this short command you can use to make them readable, writable by the owner, by the group, and so on and so forth. And that ultimately will decide when copy runs, there will be, copy will do a system call, right? It will open, it will request the operating system, please open the file with this name. And that, that's where the operating system does the check, right? That's where it checks, does this process have access to this file? And is it for reading or for writing and so on? Now, over here is uh, the cat utility, right, which can sort of concatenate files. Uh, and what I'm doing here is I'm using uh, pipes to just uh, pipe the, the contents of the file as input, and uh, I'm redirecting the output of cat to a file, okay? So this is another way that you can copy the contents of a file. Uh, but it's really interesting if you think about what's going on at the operating system layer, is very, very different because cat will read from standard input and it writes to standard output. And whatever you feed it as standard input, it can read. And you know, and wherever you direct the output is where it writes. But cat itself at no point goes back to the operating system and says, hey, I, I need to open this file because you're not actually passing uh, the name of the file to cat, you're passing a file descriptor. Right, the file descriptor is what, what sort of in, in the Unix or Linux world is this sort of reference to an open file, right? Um, and if you have that reference, you can go back to the OS and just directly sort of uh, say, I want to read from, from this file, okay? And this file descriptor, this is sort of what, this is, it's not really a capability in, um, in Linux, uh, but because it doesn't bundle the file name with a certain permission, uh, but it's getting close to the idea of, of a capability, okay? So this is how capabilities, capability-based programming is more about this, because what you're doing here is you're giving cat access to the things it needs to do its job, namely copying the thing, whereas in uh, with copy, it actually needs 
uh, the authority to read all the files that you can read in order to do its job. So it has excess authority. If let's say if copy were um, replaced by an attacker, um, then it could sort of just read arbitrary files from your file system or write to arbitrary files. Whereas if cat would be like an isolated utility that can only read what's coming in and uh, write uh, on the standard output, there's no way that it can sort of uh, abuse those privileges to uh, read something else. So, so these are the two opposing views. So the standard way that most of you will probably know from Windows or, or Linux is uh, access control lists or ACLs, ACLs, um, where you organize your access control according to identity, meaning the files have permissions on them and the permissions define who, what users or user groups have access to those files. Whereas with capabilities, we kind of switch it around and say, well, um, no, it's the processes themselves that need to have sort of pointers to the things that they want to modify. Like the file, like, you know, if, if Alice is the tax utility, they need a file descriptor. You need to pass them explicitly a file descriptor to the, the file in order to, to read from it or write to it. So these, uh, so these things that uh, sit on the file, they're called access control lists. And then uh, in the capability literature, people talk about C lists or capability lists, which are the lists that store the capabilities that your process has access to. Now, you might think that because of the way the drawing is, is done, that those models are sort of equivalent. They're like just symmetrical. It's just a, a different way of rearranging the access control. But there's a key difference. And the key difference is that um, where capability systems excel is in expressing delegation of authority. So delegation of authority means you want to give some third party or some sub-module the ability to, um, uh, you want to give it some of the authority that you have so that it can do its job, right? So in the example of CAT, I already had access to the uh, in.txt file, and I'm just delegating that authority to, uh, to the CAT utility. Uh, and so with capabilities, this is just falls out naturally. It's very easy to just, you know, you just pass a pointer. If I go back to the example in JavaScript, um, you know, uh, okay, I'm sorry because it's a bit confusing because uh, maybe the names don't really match out, but uh, Alice and Bob didn't talk to each other in the other example, but you could think of this diagram, uh, which is called like a granovator diagram, it just describes processes or objects that are communicating with each other using messages. And you can see here, Alice has a capability to Carol, which is a resource, and she's sending that pointer to Carol in the message to Bob. So Bob, after receiving that message, now also has a pointer to, to Carol. Right? And this is kind of like in the JavaScript example, I created the log object. And so the log object plays the role of Carol, let's say. And then the, the main program uh, delegated its authority to you know, write to the log or read from the log uh, to Bob and, and Alice in that example. Okay. Now, what is key in, in, in the capability system is that the capability designates both the resource and the authority uh, to uh, access it. So, um, for instance, with an, in an object capability system, really, uh, what is an object capability? It's literally just a pointer to an object. That, that, that is sort of both the simplicity and the elegance of the model. In object capability language, the capability is just a pointer to an object. And then, uh, so the resource that you're you're designating is just the object that you're pointing to. And the authority that you have is the ability to invoke one of the object's public methods. And so if Alice has a pointer to a file object, let's say, uh, then she can just call the read function or the write function to uh, exercise her authority. So this is um, what we call the capabilities. So when is a language an object capability language? So it turns out you can actually turn most existing languages into object capability languages if you remove uh, excess authority from the language. And so the first thing that you need uh, is your language has to be memory free. So object pointers in your programming language have to be unforgeable. Uh, for instance, in a language like JavaScript, uh, this is the case. Like you can't just um, cast an int to a pointer or you can't uh, 
do random access in your deep memory. In Java, that's the same. In C++, that's not the case, right? Like in C or C++, I can just take an integer um, uh, and, and just cast that uh, to an address and use that as a pointer. Uh, and I can just, uh, or use, use memcopy and so on to just have direct access to memory. I can jump around in it and so on and so forth. So C, C++, memory unsafe. Uh, so definitely not a object capability language. Java, JavaScript, uh, Python also, and so on. There you have you do have memory safety. Um, you need another property in order to have object capabilities, which is strong encapsulation. So that means an object needs a way of storing information in private fields in such a way that external uh, objects can't, you know, get in, reach inside your object and just read all the pointers stored in that. If that would be possible, you might have an object that is sort of holds a pointer to some resource that is very powerful and it just and it wants to sort of protect that. But then the moment that you pass that object to a third party module, they can just circumvent your access control. So you really need strong encapsulation. And for instance, in, in Java, you have private fields or in C sharp, but then you have these reflection modules where you can actually, using these reflection APIs, still get access to the private fields of an object. Uh, so you can sort of circumvent the privacy. Uh, so that's not good enough, right? So you, you really can't have that in, a, in an object capability language. The third uh, restriction is that your programming language um, cannot provide access to code, uh, un undeniable authority. Code. What is an example of undeniable authority? Well, if you have an import statement and you can do, let's say in Java, you can do import java.io.file and you have access to the whole file system because of that, because you have like these static methods on files to be able to uh, read any file that your process has access to. Um, also mutable global variables. Uh, if you have mutable global variables, then uh, anyone can, even the attacker can update them at will. So you, you don't want to have that. Um, and then the finally, the only way in your programming language that you can delegate authority is by using this granulometer diagram, by just sharing pointers to objects. And this is the slogan that uh, object capability people use for this is only connectivity begets connectivity. And so let me just illustrate that uh, by example. Uh, so if we have Alice, Bob, and Carol here, um, what are, think of this as a sort of a dynamical system. You, so you start at time zero and you have a certain, you know, your program is configured in a certain way. And then as your program starts running, how is it that these pointers can sort of change as your program is running? And in, a, in an object capability language, it's actually very simple to reason about because there's only three ways in which pointers can flow between variables. The first is creation. Like for instance, Alice might um, execute code there like let Carol equals name Carol. So she is the one that creates that object. So at that point, she's the only one that has a pointer to that object. So that is one way in which you can create new pointers. There is, uh, what's up, what's, yeah, it's a difficult word, endowment, uh, but it really just means uh, when, Al for instance, when Alice is created, if she gets a pointer to Carol in her constructor, she didn't create Carol, but someone else passed it to her uh, at construction time. So she's endowed with access to Carol uh, from the start. So that's the second. And then the third is, um, and that's the most common one, is uh, just a transfer of capabilities using uh, method calls, so message passing. So you just, you know, if um, Alice executes this code, so she just calls the full method on Bob and passes Carol as a pointer, at that point, Bob also gets a pointer to Carol, okay? So this is just simple rules describing how this access control graph can change over time as your program is running. And it helps you as you're doing security reviews, you can sort of reason about, it helps you reason about how um, the access control rights propagate through your code base. Okay, so um, now when you're delegating authority, a uh, very common pattern is that, uh, so for instance, when Alice shares a pointer to Carol with Bob, it could be that Bob is a module she doesn't really trust and she wants to limit the authority given to Bob. And this is sometimes called attenuation. For instance, Alice might have a read-write pointer to the file Carol and she wants Bob to only have read-only read access to that file. 
And at that point, she might actually want to give uh, Bob not just a direct pointer to Carol, but some pointer to some attenuation proxy. And I'll, I'll give an example of that in a minute. Um, there's a, another way in which you can, there are techniques in capability-based systems where if you have, if Bob has an access to Carol and yet another third party resource that he can get further access to new capabilities. But that, that would bring us too far. I'm not going to talk about that more. So last part of the talk is just to quickly um, give you an idea of these object capability patterns and actually already explained one, which is the uh, uh, sort of this, uh, you know, uh, giving the read only access. So design patterns, so who here knows this book? Okay, about half of the, the, the room. So design patterns, it's um, uh, was book published in the 90s when object-oriented programming uh, first came to the fore. Uh, and it's it's called the Gang of Four book because it was uh, authored by four, um, those four people. Uh, you know, for those that don't know, Eric Gamma, the main author, is the guy that did Eclipse, the Eclipse IDE, and he's the main author of the Visual Studio Code. Editor. So the guy, the guy knows how to write complex software. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, and so in that uh, book, they introduced lots of different design patterns, like the visitor pattern, the factory pattern, the observer pattern, the singleton pattern. I'm sure anyone here that has followed the course on object-oriented programming, especially if you wrote code in Java, you have heard of some of these names before. I hope. Uh, so it's really just a way of saying, oh, for instance. Um, if you only need a single instance of your class, you can use the singleton pattern and there's a standardized way of doing that. And everyone that sort of has read that book and sees your code will immediately know, ah, yeah, this is a singleton. And you know what that means, essentially. So it creates a language with which architects, software architects can talk to each other uh, and say, oh, I'm using a visitor here to you know, walk uh, some structure. And people immediately know that you're talking about a specific way of implementing something. And so, um, so Mark Miller, the guy I showed at the, in the introduction, who was also the lead designer of this Google Kaha system. So he wrote a, a PhD thesis in 2006. Uh, um, very essentially, if you, the way I think of that PhD thesis is he wrote the Gang of Four book for uh, object capability systems. And in that book, he describes a whole set of patterns, design patterns, uh, that you can use to uh, create um, uh, object-oriented code that can uh, be composed in a very robust fashion. Now, I'm not going to talk about all of these patterns here. It would take us a little bit uh, too far. So um, I'm just going to uh, go over a few. So um, one of the most common things you want to do in a capability system is to uh, limit the access to objects in time. For instance, let's say you have um, a browser that loads a browser extension uh, or a plugin, like you have like, like what, uh, what is it, like Photoshop that has these plugin systems and these kind of things. So when you load the plugin, it needs access to certain resources, but when you unload the plugin, it should no longer have access to those resources, okay? And so in a, in a traditional access control system, think of it like this way, right? Like um, you know, if you join an organization, you get, uh, let's say, read access to their file system, and when you leave the organization, there's an admin that has to explicitly revoke your rights, okay? So the question is, how can you do that programmatically in, in these kind of capability systems? Um, and so going back to my example, again, we have Alice and Bob here, and Alice got a pointer to the write function, Bob got a pointer to the read function, but now we want to give Bob only temporary access to the log, read access to the log. So at one point, we want to go back and, and uh, revoke the access. So in a capability system, the way that you can implement that access control logic is by not giving Bob a direct pointer to the real log object, but you give it access to a proxy object, which we call a revocable log here, um, which gives us like a pointer to not a real log, but a revocable log. And then we also get back this revoke function, which um, Alice, uh, sorry, which this piece of code can call at a later time, right? Let's say when you unload Bob, we call revoke, and that sort of um, uh, cuts the ties here on this pointer, and Bob is just left holding 
this useless object essentially. Um, so how is that implemented? Well, very simple. Uh, here's a revocable log. It's really just uh, a proxy object. And what does that mean? A proxy object, again, for those of you that know object-oriented programming and you know the proxy pattern, it's really just you're creating an object that has exactly the same API as the original. So it has the exact same set of methods and the same set of signatures, which means that Bob doesn't know that he's being given access to a fake object. He thinks he's still talking to the real log object because it has the exact same API. So to, for Bob, nothing has changed. But in reality, what we've done is we've given him access to this object that by default will actually just um, forward the, the write to the real one and the read to the real one. But we have this revoke function which we, with which we can actually set that pointer to null and then uh, you know, Bob will, have, will no longer have access to the, uh, to the, uh, to the law object. Okay? So we drop the pointer and that's a way of sort of enforcing that uh, temporary access. Um, and so this is actually, this, um, uh, this is just one example of a more general pattern that's called taming. And taming is the process of taking a very powerful API and logging it down. So you just give access to a subset of the resources. And so uh, instead of Bob getting a direct pointer to some uh, API that gives you access to resources on the host, you give them access to a restricted API access, like for instance, read-only file system access. And the read-only wrapper will need access to the real file system API to uh, access the, the files, okay? And uh, this is, for example, this uh, Google project. It's discontinued now. But it, so what, what Google did when they developed that originally was, oh, we want to have like a web page, and a web page can consist of multiple widgets, and those widgets are written in JavaScript, and you all want to include them on the same web page, but you do not want, if one of these widgets is malicious, you do not want it to be able to read data from these other widgets, right? So that was sort of what they wanted to achieve. And the way they achieved that is actually they loaded the JavaScript in a sandbox, a secure sandbox, very similar to the Lava Mode tool I just showed you earlier. And then that sandbox code got access not to the real document object, model, not to the real HTML page, but it got access to a bunch of wrappers, these proxy objects, that for the JavaScript code were indistinguishable from the real DOM API. So these, these widgets, whenever they sort of generated HTML um, or talked to these, these query, these DOM objects, it would look and feel like the real HTML page, but actually it was a protective wrapper around the real uh, DOM nodes. And that is how they were able to enforce that, that, that security constraint. Um, I'm going to skip over this. Um, you can certainly, if you're interested, um, have a look at the slides. I just wanted to, to you know, uh, wrap up on time. So um, a few more words. So first of all, these, these, these patterns, like this taming and these compartments and this hard JavaScript thing and so on and so forth. So um, it all sounds very exotic. Uh, but these, these things are actually used, being used in the industry in various places. You just need to know sort of where to look. Uh, probably the most, I mean, one of the higher profile ones is uh, Firefox actually uses some of these techniques to isolate um, uh, websites from uh, privileged JavaScript code. So you can actually write, uh, this is not for standard websites, but you can write extensions to Firefox. And then you need ways of uh, making sure that your, uh, you know, the code that is running as part of a web page can't escalate its privileges by getting access to objects that belong to your plugin, because the plugin has more authority. It can do more things. Plugin code can do more things than regular web pages. And they use these um, object capabilities to uh, isolate access. Salesforce, uh, well-known company, right? They create these sort of uh, CRM systems, and CRP systems, and so on. Uh, they also need a way, they use JavaScript as an extensibility layer. So you can add your own JavaScript to their platform. Again, they have a need to do that in a secure way. Kaha was another example I already talked about. I already mentioned Agoric. They're using that for um, writing DeFi and smart contracts. And then, uh, so MetaMask, the company is the company that uh, developed Lava Mode. And they're using that also uh, in their crypto web wallet to sandbox plugins extensions that developers can write. So 
the, the recurring pattern here is if you have a need, if you have a product that is extensible and you let third parties execute code on your platform, you better make sure that you isolate that JavaScript code. You just don't run the JavaScript code as part of your main application untouched because that's going to get you into trouble. So just to wrap up, what did we talk about? So uh, in the first part, I talked about why application security is becoming more important. Why is it? Because yeah, this problem of you have many, many modules making up an application. They all run as part of the same process, as part of the same app. But some of that code you wrote and you trust, but some of that code you downloaded from the internet and you have no way to know if it's compromised or buggy and so on, you want to isolate that. Um, so then I talked a lot about this principle of this authority, which is all about, remember the example of copy versus cat. It is about giving access to the application only the resources it needs to do its job and nothing more. And I illustrated that with this example of Alice and Bob having a shared pointer to a log. Alice is only able to write. Bob is only able to read. And then I showed you how, how to sort of set that up in a secure way in JavaScript. Then I talked about this object capability model and contrasted it with access control lists. And then I sort of very briefly, but you can, I, I'll upload the slides, I'll share the slides later and you can have a look at other of these patterns, just different ways in which you can further create fine-grained access control policies in this uh, paradigm. So the takeaway messages are that, you know, in modern applications, uh, and this is actually true, not just for JavaScript, right? Like Java has Maven, Python has this pip package manager. If you're doing modern software development, you will have a software supply chain. You download code from third parties. You want to make sure that you limit the authority of that code. Uh, so you need a way to isolate or sandbox code. Uh, I showed you how to do that for JavaScript with Lava mode. And then you need to have a notion of, okay, even if I restrict access to these uh, modules, you need ways of getting those modules to uh, cooperate in a secure way. I think understanding those patterns is really important in a world of uh, you know, over 2 million NPM modules. And in, in especially for JavaScript, as this technology is now also being used for, like in, in, for creating cryptocurrency wallets, smart contracts, and so on, there you know, the stakes are even higher, right? Like if you, if you have a, a breach in authority in a, in a smart contract, then you get the same problems that maybe some of you know of Ethereum and the kinds of hacks that happen on that platform. You get those kinds of uh, issues, right? And then real real money is at stake. Um, so uh, I also have a lot of further reading pointers to talks online, interesting stuff that you can find in the slides. And uh, but with that, I'm uh, ready to wrap up. Uh, are there any questions?